My name is Peter Sokolowski. I'm an editor at Merriam-Webster, and we are gathered tonight for a program called The Changing Language of Disability. Uh, and uh, this will be a fascinating dictionary-driven conversation, as we've already heard. Um, and uh, I will begin also by describing myself, not just introducing myself. I'm a white man who has no hair on his head, but very dark eyebrows. Uh, but we have a wonderful panel this evening to hear from uh, on this subject, the changing language, uh, the changing culture, the way the dictionary and the way that words affect each other and the way the dictionary reflects those changes. Uh, and I'm just gonna take a moment to begin uh, to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of New England Public Media. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'll remind you that I'm the co-host of a podcast about words from the perspective of the dictionary. It's called Word Matters uh, with my colleagues, uh, Emily Brewster and Ammon Shea. Uh, that podcast is produced at New England Public Media. And it's been a huge success. Uh, and uh, we recommend that you, you check it out if you love words. Uh, we ask you also to put your questions uh, into the Q&A box that's at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will get to those questions toward the end of the hour. Um, I do wanna just make a couple of uh, brief introductory remarks about the connections to the dictionary, the connections to our region as well. Um, whenever I talk about language and dictionaries, I talk about language change. And to, to, to start our conversation, we're gonna look at uh, just a, one or two examples of very basic changes in language. And one is uh, shown here in an entry from the Oxford English Dictionary. And um, this is a very nice word, it's the word nice. Uh, but most of us don't think of it in its original meaning, uh, that what it meant uh, a thousand years ago was silly or ignorant uh, when used of a person. It was a synonym of the word foolish. And yet we don't use that word nice in that way anymore. And this is just a great basic example of language change. Language changes over time. And sometimes we notice those changes, often we don't. Another example that's sort of similar is the word wonderful, which I use frequently to mean excellent. Um, and yet, if you use that word wonderful before about World War II, you actually meant something else altogether. For example, in the King James Bible, um, there are sentences like, uh, God, thy plagues are wonderful, which clearly means astonishing, surprising, uh, causing fear. Um, and also in the, in the correspondences of Thomas Jefferson, uh, at the end of his life, writing a letter, um, he said to another uh, correspondent, uh, the fact that I can't remember the events of 40 years ago is not wonderful. So again, that means astonishing, surprising. Now that word for most of us means, um, so, uh, means uh, excellent. So that's one of the ways in which, um, in which language changes. Uh, something else I want to share with you is the connections between our event today and our region and indeed my own office, because um, the uh, name of the library at Smith College is the Nielsen Library. Uh, William Nielsen was the president of Smith College. He was also a professor at Harvard before that, where one of his students at Radcliffe was Helen Keller. Um, but we're going to look at another entry, an entry from the dictionary that he edited at Merriam-Webster. He was president of Smith and editor-in-chief at the same time. That dictionary is uh, over my shoulder behind me right now. It's a very big dictionary, the edition of 1934. And I'm just going to read to you the entry from 1934 for the entry of mental deficiency. It is labeled psychology. It says, lack of intelligence, such as to disqualify an individual from parity with his fellows in school or in later life, feeble mindedness. In the most extreme degree, idiocy, the individual, idiot, is incapable of connected speech or of avoiding the common dangers of life. In the next degree, in order upwards, imbecility, the individual, imbecile, commonly is incapable of earning a living. And in the mildest degree, moronity, the, in, the individual moron requires supervision in work, recreation, and the general conduct of life. Now, obviously, there's a lot of surprising, maybe shocking um, uh, statements uh, and words in that definition. But we can regard uh, Nielsen of, uh, as a man of his time, as a man who was unusually sensitive, in fact, uh, and I will just, to conclude my introduction, read one uh, brief passage from a biography of Nielsen. 
Among the young women who crowded Nelson's, uh, Nielsen's Radcliffe lecture room was Helen Keller, who entered in the fall of 1899 and took her AB degree cum laude in 1904. She was accompanied by her, her companion teacher, Anne Sullivan, uh, and uh, who sat beside her tapping the lecturer's words into her palm. One of their fellow students remembers how she used to turn around in her seat to watch Miss Keller's face light up a moment after the rest of the class had responded to some flash of the Nielsen wit. Uh, Mrs. Macy's biographer says that Nielsen was the only one of Miss Keller's instructors who took the trouble to learn the manual alphabet so that he could communicate with her directly. So that's a fascinating insight in, in uh, William Nielsen's personality um, and the history of uh, Merriam-Webster dictionaries. We're gonna continue this conversation uh, with remarks from our panel. And we begin with Lawrence Carter Long. He's been on the front lines of popular culture and social change since the age of five, when he was drafted to be a poster child for a disability related charity campaign. A lifelong activist, Lawrence has been a modern dancer, radio show host and producer, and was the curator and co-host of the, Pro the Projected Image, a history of disability on film. Formerly the staff, uh, formerly the public affairs specialist for the National Council on Disability, he joined the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund in 2017 as Director of Communications. Let us welcome Lawrence Carter Long. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to have this conversation. You know, I was really struck um, with the words that you provided and the, the fact that it showed kind of a hierarchy. But what did that hierarchy boil down to? At the end of the day, what it basically intoned and what it basically communicated was that disability is bad. And what has that led us to today? You'll see on your screen, there's an image of a person holding a sign and the sign shows the universal access symbol, the wheelchair symbol, with the wheel portion blurred out. And it says, see the person, not the disability. So let's unpack that a little bit. What happens when we see the person, not the disability? So for most of human history, disability was just a diagnosis. That was the only option. But through time, the concept as you intoned has grown and it's evolved and continues to. This presents a unique opportunity to expand the palette and to add to the existing lingui linguistic menu options to really encompass everything that disability has evolved to mean here in 2021. Now this includes, but it's not limited to a shared sense of history, a unique culture, power political constituencies, personal and collective identity, and perhaps most notably for something that for most of human history has been shrouded in shame, a vibrant, vital community. So what do we need to do? What is the ultimate goal here? As I set the stage, I think the most important thing you can do, culturally speaking, is to remove the shame that we've been conditioned to feel surrounding disability and replace the shame and the blame with something better. Hold it up to the light, if you will. Let's start by considering or reconsidering the prefix dis. I think the poor prefix dis has been sadly and mistakenly aligned, aligned, maligned because, well, think about how the prefix is used. It reverses the meaning of whatever word it is attached to. Now, this isn't always a negative, as we've been sort of led to believe. We look at words like disillusioned, for example. The prefix dis has a liberating effect. It can also free us from rigid, antiquated conditioning and bias in terms of appreciating, welcoming, and valuing different bodies, different minds, and ways of being if we let it. And if we begin to relate to it in this way. Another thing, euphemisms. We've often been taught we're not supposed to talk about it. It's gonna make disabled people uncomfortable. It makes non-disabled people uncomfortable. So we say things like physically challenged or differently abled. 
But what do those things mean? Differently abled includes everyone, disabled or not. And most importantly, doesn't protect anybody from bias, barriers, or discrimination. Quick tip, handicap these days is reserved for bowling and golf, sporting events. Juggling while riding a unicycle while on a tightrope, well, that might legitimately be considered differently able. And so remember, as we get into this conversation today, it isn't just what you say, but why you're saying it. A big part of that is learning to be mindful of the consequences of segregating, minimizing, or in the case of disability, erasing altogether. Think about it in this way. If you don't see the disability, you aren't likely to spot the discrimination we face or the access needs that disabled people have either. But there's an easy fix, see both. So ask yourself, what does disabled mean to you? What does it mean to disabled people? What does it mean to non-disabled people? Think about the relationship we have to not only the word, but the concepts that it has come to illustrate. Let's consider the difference between using people with disabilities, which is common, or saying people of disability, like we do with people of color. You know, there was an effort by self-advocates in the 70s to put people first because of the shame, because of the stigma that's been long associated with disability. But how does this use of those prepositions of, with, change our relationship to disability and to disabled people? We also should consider insider versus outsider language or the difference between, right? Claiming an identity, who is doing the labeling and what the effect of that label might be. Disabled people have long sort of used insider language to refer to ourselves. Polios, cardios, people with cerebral palsy like myself refer to ourselves as seeps. That's a lot easier than saying cerebral palsy. And that really was started in some ways by the autistic community saying autistic and really claiming that word as an identity. So as we move forward and as we discuss, let's think of how these words continue to change and what our relationship to them is. I also just realized that I neglected to do the visual description of myself. So I'll do that. I'm a middle-aged white man with gray framed glasses, a blue sports coat and a very impressive bookshelf behind me. Beautiful, thank you, Lawrence. And, you. and, and I, I do appreciate your bookshelf. Um, and we are going to move move the conversation uh, before we all speak together. We are going to hear individually from our panelists. Laura Rauscher, MED, is Director of Disability Services, ADA Coordinator at Smith College and Adjunct Faculty in the Smith School for Social Work, where she teaches courses on disability policy and ableism. As a, disabil as a disabled person and a feminist working in the disability rights public health and higher education fields for more than 30 years, Laura has dedicated her career to advancing equality and inclusion of people with disabilities in society. Before joining Smith College, she was director of the Office of Disability and Health at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Welcome, Laura Rauscher. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all tonight. I am a middle-aged woman with dark, long dark hair and a maroon colored shirt on tonight. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here kind of um, because of my connection to Smith and all of the connections that Peter has, has started us out with tonight. That's really exciting. Um, I wish I was more of a his, historian and had lots more exciting facts for you. Um, but I, I think this is a really interesting area for people to delve into. And with our beautiful new um, Nielsen Library, it's a great place to come and learn more about words and, and all of the, the um, history that we're all so excited about. 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about disability, civil rights, and um, the evolution that we've we've gone through as a community in terms of how we've how we understand our experience and how important words have been to the process of kind of um, what you might call naming and claiming um, your I, not only your identity but your kind of place in the world and your um, uh, your your power in in many ways. And I think for disability community, at least in contemporary um, sense, you know, we people were very inspired and influenced and have drawn from other civil rights movements and other, um, you know, empowerment kinds of movements, labor, um, and, and learned a lot in those movements. And so we, you know, we came into an understanding of our experiences uh, as being ones of discrimination, um, of oppression, and, uh, you know, that led to a really powerful civil rights movement. And um, I hope that that people had a chance over the last year or so to see the film called Crip Camp. And uh, you know, that really is a fantastic um, window into the last 30 or 40 years of 40, 40 or more years of the right of the battle for civil rights for people with disabilities. And again, you know, interesting again right there is the word crip. And you know, when the movement started, or uh, when those folks were um, the people who are featured in the movie um, were there at the the crip camp, the camp for crippled kids, uh, they probably that term was, you know, probably more a little more acceptable and sort of has, you know, become less and less um, an acceptable term. And and yet here it is, here it shows up again as the primary name of this extraordinary film that captures the disability rights movement. And I think it again, it's again how, me, um, how words can change in their meaning and in their power. So it, it becomes a word that community has in a sense taken back um, much the way that people have kind of reclaimed words like queer to try to um, both take the, the stigma and the sting out of them, but also to kind of claim them in a way that gives us a power back over them and allows us to kind of redefine what they mean. So you know, in many ways, those are our kind of in-group terms. They're not necessarily terms that we use um, every day, but they have uh, a purpose for social connection and social bonding and and a way of naming and claiming our experience. And it's so important to me, especially as a person who now works with young people to understand the extraordinary value of that process of naming and claiming and that each generation has a need, really a need to do that for itself. So I laugh at sometimes at all the struggles we have in our society over political correctness and this sense of saying the right word and choosing the right word and being scolded for using the wrong word. Uh, and yet so much of that for me, especially again, working with young folks is watching people go through this very essential human process of, of making sense out of what they see around them. Um, and that's not easy to do, especially when you are part of a marginalized, um, or targeted community because we are often sort of um, gaslighted by uh, the, the veneer of society that says, you know, disability is a bad thing. You don't want to be disabled. Um, it's, there's so many ways that people are looked down on or marginalized that it's a real challenge for young people to, to take that terminology and find the beauty and meaning and generative nature of it. And how it it's really speaks to me as an adult disabled person, how important it is for me and how it important it is for, for young people to have role models, to have connection to disability community, to disabled adults and to each other, to really have a place to go through that process of kind of um, 
taking a term, rolling it around in your mouth, saying, does that fit me? Um, does that make sense? Is that how I want to talk about the people that I'm connected with? Is that how I want to tell the story of my mood of the, the people that I that I know and that I'm advocating with and for? Is are these the words I want to choose to talk about the change that's happening, about the hopes and aspirations that I have for my community? And people desperately need you know, safe and supportive places to have those kinds of conversations. And really, we, we all go through that at some level. But it becomes particularly important for, for communities um, dealing with marginalization. And I think that, you know, we've, we've gone through a long time of talking about disability rights. We talk about empowerment. Um, we talk about leadership, you know, any number of terms. And we've also seen a switch, not a switch, but a movement toward some broader, uh, the sort of broader concept from civil rights to talking about the concept of disability justice. And in a sense, disability justice is really an interesting and important terminology because it really um, has come up from disabled communities of color, queer communities, people who have been, certainly have been part of the whole disability movement, have been on the forefront of fighting for civil rights forever, but who have not always been the face of the disability movement and for whom the idea of civil rights, which in a sense our, our intentions are intentionally about gaining us access to the system that we have. And when the system that we have doesn't always work for you because of other factors like racism and sexism and homophobia, it, it makes sense that there needs to be a bigger emphasis on what justice and equity look like. And so we've seen communities of color come forward and really take hold of this, this battle and talk about transformative prox, you know, processes and, and really looking at a bigger questions of justice and how we can make the world more equitable and more fair for all communities. And um, if people have in, are inclined, it's really exciting to look up some of these terms, to look up disability justice, to look up the disability justice principles, which are fascinating and talk about, use this very beautiful language about um, centering the most impacted and when I think about that has been really a transformative phrase for me because I keep asking myself after 30, 20 years of being at the college and, and all the changes we made, there still are times when I think, wow, I, I'm surprised that we might be still dealing with this or that or in the world, things that I'm involved in. You, you're sort of surprised 30 years after the ADA, there's still things going on and you're thinking like, what is it that keeps catching people? And some of that is really getting an understanding of how um, that, um, you know, in a capitalist society, we want to be able to, uh, you know, it's part and parcel of that to differentiate people according to their abilities. And we have a kind of narrative about the idea, the idea that there's some sort of natural way that some people are better than others and some people deserve resources and some people don't. So, you know, we can also kind of unpack that terminology and how disability is used in many ways to justify other forms of oppression. So I think this is a time for really uh, another very, very important word is the phrase intersectionality. And we're coming to understand that um, as the disability community um, understand the ways that we have to be working in con consort around uh, racist, anti-racist work, anti-homophobia work and doing all that uh, con con um, consecutively. You know, and it, this can't be a, when, we, when we're done with that, we'll get to that. You have to see how whole everybody, see people as whole and move these agendas forward together. So I'm excited to see that work going on and to see the language that's emerging from that, um, especially given the, you know, the racial 
conversations that we're having in the, our nation and how um, disabled people are, are, you know, disabled people of color are emerging as huge leaders in both the racial justice movements and in disability rights movements. So I'll just leave you with that and say, you know, um, you know, read up, look, take a look at some of the incredible stuff that people are doing under this framework of disability justice. And when we do center people who are most impacted, we're going to take care of everybody. We're going to figure out how to meet the needs of our um, of every all people in our nation. So that that's kind of my my final remark for now. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Laura, for your uh, comments on civil rights and justice. And before we uh, have a conversation about all of this with our panel, we introduce our third panelist. Fred Palka is a person with disabilities who began his work in the disability community in 1983 as a volunteer at the Boston Center for Independent Living. He is the author of the ABC CLIO Companion to the Disability Rights Movement, the Civil War Letters of Charles F. Johnson, Invalid Corps, and What We Have Done, an Oral History of the Disability Rights Movement. His most recent book, A Different Blaze, is a collection of his poetry. This past winter, he taught a course on disability advocacy and its history at UMass Amherst's University Without Walls. Welcome, Fred Pelka. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I feel uh... I feel quite honored and a little intimidated following the, the, the panelists we've just heard. Um, my name is Fred Palka. I am uh, an older male. I've got brown hair that's kind of graying. I wear bifocals. I have a not so impressive bookshelf behind me and uh, a reproduction of a Marc Chagall painting called The Roses, which reminds me of, you know, Rose by any other name or Gertrude Stein, a rose is a rose is a rose since we're talking about language. Um, I wanna talk about three instances where we can, in a sense, measure the progress that has been made by the movement and, and the trajectory of the movement um, by some of the changes in the language. Um, not so much changes, but how different phrases and words are perceived. This is very thirsty work. Um, uh, my first example would be a, a phrase, uh, the, the word normalization. Um, historically, normalization was a concept that was started in Denmark in the 1950s. Um, it was started in itself as a, uh, its, its beginnings is a, a fascinating part of disability history in itself. And um, we probably won't get into that. But uh, Elizabeth Boggs, one of the pioneers of the parents movement of the late 1940s and 50s, uh, addresses this in a lecture she did, which I recommend to people. What normalization said essentially is that people with disabilities, particularly in this instance, referring most often to people with de developmental or cognitive disabilities should be raised, educated and otherwise treated in as quote, normal a context as possible. Uh, in a sense, this was an early iteration of the whole concept of least restrictive environment. Um, that is such a touchstone of disability rights uh, litigation today. Uh, and so instead of sending disabled kids away to residential schools for, in quotes, the retarded, uh, normalization said, let's send them to mainstream public schools. Um, instead of segregating them in basements uh, or I isolated special education classrooms, let's try to incorporate them into, in quotes, regular classrooms. Instead of institutionalizing them, often as children, often for life in massive state schools and hospitals, so-called, such as Willowbrook or Penhurst or Belchertown, let's do what we can to support their families so that they can be raised at home with their own parents and siblings. And then as they grow older, take their place in the community like everyone else. The champion of uh, normalization in the U United States was a psychologist named Wolf Wolfensberger, who's a real pioneer in this regard. It's difficult, I think, today to convey how radical, how revolutionary an idea this was. In the United States, the idea didn't really take off until the 1970s, a decade or more after it was first introduced. It was met with tremendous skepticism. To give you an idea of the thinking of the time, I would refer you to a quote that's taken from Mouth Magazine, uh, which was a disability rights publication back in the 1990s 
edited and published by Lucy Gwynn. Um, it's attributed to the head of the Spastic Society of Britain, which is uh, sort of the UK version of United Cerebral Palsy here in the United States. He was asked whether he could ever foresee a time when spastics, as they were called, would ever head that organization. He responded by saying, that would be like putting dogs and cats in charge of the Humane Society. Which gives you an idea, I think, of the thinking of the time. Fast forward now, four decades or so, and normalization, in quotes, is not only not radical or revolutionary, some today would see the term itself as reactionary. Normalization, what's so great about being normal? You want to, de to deny us our identity as a person with a disability? What is normal anyway, and who gets to define it? In an era of neurodiversity, normalization would seem to be a giant step backwards, a step back into the shame that Lawrence was talking about earlier. So sometimes a single word, even a single letter can make a difference, can signal a major shift in our thinking. In 1940, a group of blind advocates banded together to found the National Federation of the Blind, the NFB, which is still active today. The thing to notice is that word of, until then, organizations, usually charities, were organized not of or by, but for people with disabilities. Think again about that quote about dogs and cats. It was the, uh, the American Foundation for the Blind that Helen Keller worked with so intimately. The National Association for Retarded Children, which morph morphed into the Association for Retarded Citizens and is now known simply as the ARC. Organizers of the NFB, National Federation of the Blind, met considerable pushback from what they called the blindness establishment, cited educators and service providers who didn't much like the idea of blind people forming and heading their own organizations and drawing up their own agendas for change. So that one word, of, instead of for, denotes a major shift in disability organizing and history. Uh, I'll just hit on one more instance of uh, a change in language and Lawrence hit on this. Um, I, wanna, I wanna come back to that. Um, this past year, as was mentioned, I taught a course at UMass Amherst on the history of disability advocacy. One of my students contacted me and wanted to know why I kept using the phrase people with disabilities instead of say, disabled people. This student felt that I was somehow dissing their identity as if, as Lawrence pointed out, I was trying to make their disability disappear. But that phrase itself, people with disabilities, comes at, came at the end of a process, a dynamic, particularly strong in the 1960s and 70s of people with disabilities feeling the necessity to assert their basic humanity, to say, I'm not a wheelchair, I'm a person who uses a wheelchair. I'm not a spastic, I'm a person first who may have issues with spasticity and so on. Uh, they, again, think of that quote. It'd be like putting dogs and cats in charge of the Humane Society. There was indeed an entire movement as Lawrence talked about called People First, which sought to claim the essential identity, the essential humanity of people so often labeled and perceived as less than. I'm hoping that the pushback on that construction, people with disabilities, is perhaps an indication that in this regard, at least, we've made some much needed and much welcome progress. And uh, with that, I think I'll stop for now and we can begin to get into a back and forth conversation. But thank you all um, for, for, for being here and for inviting me. Well, thank you so much, Fred. Uh, and thank you to Laura and Lawrence. And I, I, I'm just gonna start the conversation uh, among the three of you uh, to ask you to comment on things. I mean, Lawrence, you talked about the language. Laura, you talked about civil rights and justice and Fred talked about uh, really policy, but these, these fascinating subjects touch each other on that big issue of identity, don't they? That um, sometimes it's the little words, the small words that you actually all referred to. Um, so, I mean, my basic question to begin is, do we believe in progress? How much progress can we measure with language? 
Um, and, and, and how would you measure that progress? So we'll start with Lawrence, perhaps, yeah. I, yeah, it seems to me that, um, you, you know, since disability, as we've all sort of talked about here, has been almost since time began shrouded in shame. Um, the fact that people are claiming it, naming it, owning it, um, um, is definitely a positive. Now, not all of society is caught up. Every, you know, as everybody, people are at different points along that path and along that journey. And it takes some sort of introspection and some thinking, right? Because people tend to adopt whatever phrase they first became familiar with, whether it was 50 years ago or five years ago. And so whatever that person of influence kind of told them, well, that's the one they kind of cling to. What I'm seeing, and I, this is somebody, I'm 54 now. And, and, you know, when I was a kid in the 1970s, I was taught, as, as Fred was kind of uh, intoning, to try to be as normal as possible. And now it, it wasn't until I was in my mid thirties and I'd always identified as a disabled person, but I'd never gotten involved with disability community at all. And in my mid thirties, I started asking myself, what have I been missing? Is there something out there that I should maybe tap into or be a part of or learn from? And what I realized at that point as I started making that effort myself um, was that there was a whole community, a series of communities out there that had been down the roads that, that, that I was looking to travel, that had fought those fights, that, that had struggled and crawled upstairs and protested and, and risked life and limb um, um, so that I could call myself disabled. You know, and there was a new generation, a generation younger than me, that because of the ADA and other laws um, said, if you've got a problem with disability, that's your problem. I don't have to carry that around. I feel differently and this is why. And so I think even the fact that New England Public Media is doing this conversation and that we have, you know, pushing up against like 200 people joining along and hopefully hundreds more are gonna see it later is a clear sign of progress. Mm. We can and Laura, actually you, talk about it now. Exactly, and Laura, you mentioned um, in, in your remarks um, the, uh, the changes that you saw, and especially this question of identity and social justice. There's no question from the dictionary perspective uh, that uh, terms of identity are among the most important terms that, that we can recognize and define today, terms of racial and gender and uh, sexual identity uh, and, and certainly uh, dis disability. Um, my question to you, Laura, is, uh, the policies on campus or on campuses across America, have they spread? Have they spread into communities and outside and beyond? In other words, I assume that there's some, uh, in some sense, a, a feeling of being a pioneer on, on your part. Yes, I've certainly seen a lot of change in 30 years from when I went to college and there was one, one floor in one dorm that was accessible and everyone that was disabled lived in the same dorm on the same floor. And, uh, you know, our, at least at our school, we've spent a lot of time making our campus accessible and we still have some challenges, but overall, I think the accessibility is amazing. Um, but also I think that it's really important that the conversation has broadened that we're not just thinking about disability in terms of physical accessibility anymore. In fact, the majority of students that are served by the office that I run are students who have other types of disabilities, chronic health conditions, mental health conditions, and a number of non sort of non visible or non apparent kinds of conditions. And you know, that speaks a lot to the difference, uh, the differences in the times and the reasons why people are experiencing disability, but it also speaks not just to the, again, disability isn't just in the person. The disability is manifested by the environments around us. And so as technology has burgeoned, we see both incredible opportunities that have diminished people's experience of literal disability being unable to do something, but it has also created new challenges and new barriers. If we're not careful, we'll leave another whole generation behind. 
if we if we aren't um, vigilant to make sure that our technology environments are accessible. So things have changed, but you know you kind of weave with the times and the new the new barriers crop up. And unless we really in, um, in, uh, internalize it, we're not going to. We need to internalize it so we see these things as they come up, and we continue to to, to fight the battles. And what I'm hearing from both you and Lawrence is that we need examples, that we, that we need your examples, um, that we need to hear the language uh, to, for it to become familiar. And that's such an important point that all language is actually habit. You know, if, yeah. if a word is new, um, then we will react as speakers of that language. We might say that's wrong, that's not a word. But once we've heard it and say we hear, hear it a few times mm -hmm. a week and then a few times a day, then it becomes mm -hmm. comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's good. I would like to ask Fred something. You mentioned, Fred, I'd like you to expand on something because you referred to the normalization as a, as a movement, um, but also uh, there's another piece to that word if we were, if we, we are addressing vocabulary, which is that the, the normal school um, mm -hmm. refers to something very specific that might be something that we as a culture are forgetting. Could you elaborate? Yeah, I, I, that, that is um, that Laurie Block talks a lot about, the, uh, about that. Um, well, normal schools, I think, were schools for educating educators. They were places where teachers would go, or people would go to learn how to be teachers. Uh, and those were called normal schools. Um, I want to get back to the question that you asked about measuring progress. Please. And, and, and it, it's a complicated question. Um, I think there are, inst it, there are instances where there's been progress within the movement, within the community, but not that hasn't really been reflected in the broader community. I mean, for example, um, the psychiatric survivor community, what, what's called the psychiatric survivor community. Um, there's a film out that, that is just excellent. I recommend it to everyone. It's called Healing Voices. And it's, it's about a movement of people who hear voices, you know, what we would describe as hallucinations, who instead of treating this as uh, this horrific psychopathology that needs to be medicated out of existence and we need to be afraid of, uh, they've come together to strategize among themselves about how to deal with this issue, how to live with it as a form of disability, but not as this sort of life uh, threatening, horrible thing that needs to be stamped out at all costs. That's, that's movement within the community. I don't know that the, the uh, psychiatric, psychological um, mainstream has caught up with that. Uh, and, and you know, if we're talking about labels, I mean, so much of what, um, what the psychiatric survivor community deals with are labels that are imposed by the outside, by the DSM, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic uh, Manual. Um, so it's been, it's been uneven, you know? Um, one thing that I'm uh, encouraged to see is, yeah, young people who are way more sophisticated and erudite and self-aware than I certainly was at, at, at their age. Uh, so that gives me great hope. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, I mean, the sensibility and sensitivity is really what you're talking about. And you, you made me think about something, which is that that word pathology uh, is another one. I mean, better understanding the pathology can lead in the best scenario to a more humanist response to a more human kind of language. You know, in other words, there is science behind this too. We're, in other, we, we understand some things better than we used to. Um, and I can speak from the dictionary perspective, that definition that we began tonight's program with is not a current definition because we understand better. Uh, how these words are, should be used and can be used. I can tell you that uh, just a month ago, the label now often offensive was added to the entry for mental retardation in the dictionary. So there's a term that has been out there and has been in its time a, um, a technical term, a diagnostic term, but has evolved into something else. Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know, within, again, just sticking with the psychiatric survivor community, um, there's a difference between talking about, say, psychosis and altered state, right? A psychotic break as opposed to an extreme state of emotion. Um, you know, the words make a lot of a, a lot of uh, 
they, they carry a lot of power. They, can't, they, they have a charge to them, positive or negative, like electrons and protons, so. And, and, and you, yeah, and I was gonna say, Laura, going back to, you, you talked about taking control of language with a word like crip, for example, which, yeah. we, which is all, we also label as offensive. And yet, if you reclaim it, I was just going to say that I think that you ask about sign of progress and what Fred's talking about where psych survivors are naming these things and are saying, no, it's not psychosis. Altered states is how I understand it. We're the people who live with this. We're the people experience it. And we're trying to tell you these are the, these are the descriptors that make more sense to us. And so I think it's a huge sign of progress that we are listening to people to a certain extent, you know, it is, it does creep in. Like you said, the mental health system is not, you know, immediately going to jump on some of these terms because, you know, we could, uh, we could have a lot of speculation about the, uh, the financial benefit of drugs and all of that. But, you know, I think people really are being, are having, are having spaces to find those words and to rename them and to really cause people to stop and and uh, and respect that we do have the ability to name our own experience and that people can learn from that. I, I think we can't and you know we can't have this conversation without talking about COVID and truly the ways in which that was a disability experience for everyone going through this experience where one day you are not able to do the things you were able to do yesterday. Your whole life is turned upside down. And in a, in a very short period of time, people had to regroup, rethink, reframe, redirect, and find new ways of finding joy and purpose in their lives. And lo and behold, a lot of people were able to do that, which is not to diminish the fact that many, many people were, suffered terribly. But there were lessons and the disability community had an awful lot to teach people during that time because that's what we do. That's who we are as people and as a community. And so it's really been a powerful moment to look at how our thinking about disability really has shaped a lot of how we've gotten through COVID. That's fascinating. And it's brought more people into this conversation who want to talk about that who got a taste of that experience of disability can be generative. It can bring us to new understandings if we're willing to listen to those voices. And so I hope that, you know, we will be able to continue to bring some wisdom to that, to the healing of this crisis that we've lived through. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, um, there's a question from our um, audience um, and I'll pose it to the three of you. It's uh, uh, again about language. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the changing meaning of the word diversity, which in my experience came to embrace people with disabilities, but is now evolving to be nearly exclusively focused on race. This from our, um, uh, our, uh, uh, from our audience today, tonight. So would you like to, and this may be the way we conclude tonight, maybe the way that we can address this term diversity among disability for all of you <laughs> well disability has diversity kind of baked into it i mean whether you're looking at physical disability intellectual disability sensory related disabilities psychological disability the list could go on right there's a huge swath of diversity within disability communities if you will um, it always means that there's sort of more than one person uh, you know, whether it's places, rehab facilities like Warm Springs or um, camps like Clamp Jeanette, where you saw in Crib Camp, right? Something pretty miraculous happens when people with disabilities and people with different disabilities come together. They start relating to each other. They start sharing their own experiences. And then usually they get a little ticked off. <laughs> and then what happens when they realize I'm not the only one this is happening to, um, people begin to protest. They begin to reach out to their elected officials who are supposed to represent them. Sometimes demonstrations occur and sometimes laws get passed. I think it's, it's that kind of um, diversity of action where you understand that people with disabilities, disability communities, if you will, 
are experts at work, maneuvering through a world, navigating a world that wasn't built with us in mind. Mm -hmm. That is an important skill set. That is something that we can use in every facet of life. Um, some people still haven't got the memo, but I think we're closer now um, than we have been um, um, throughout different points in human history. I would say too, the word of diversity is not as, as prominent in, that, in those conversations right now. I think that you know, people are really looking for action and the conversations around diversity, are, are, they're nice and they're important in, in many ways because we like to talk about how we're all different and what we can learn from each other and that's important. But I think again, we're at a moment where there's time, people want action and they wanna be having conversations about action oriented things. So I think diversity is not that disabled people are just being left out about it. It's not really the central aspect of those kinds of conversations. We're talking about equity, we're talking about justice, we're talking about action oriented kinds of things right now. And Fred, for the last word. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, uh, as, as Lawrence pointed out, uh, the, the, the disabled community, which is really almost a misnomer, Paul Longmore is a historian, dis disability historian, and he talks about how there really is no such thing as a disability rights movement. There are a bunch of different movements, constituencies that come together from time to time and then drift apart from time to time. Um, but Diversity, yeah, diversity is something that, that the, the community has been involved with in a long time, but that also doesn't mean that um, there have been challenges. I mean, the, dis the disability community, communities in America are plagued with, infected with the same sorts of um, dysfunction that American society as a whole faces. I mean, there's racism, at all levels of our society, and that includes within and without the disability rights community. There's homophobia, there's sexism, misogyny, white supremacy, all of these things are baked in to our culture. So anyone who, who partakes of that culture in any way is going to be, um, in a sense, a part of that. And it's something, I think it's something we're becoming more conscious of, hopefully. Um, and that hopefully is a first step toward dealing with it. But as Laura says, you know, action, action is what is needed. And uh, we're facing a variety of crises at this point. And um, I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we can all move forward. And, and uh, talking about the language is a big step in that direction. Yes, well, you, I mean, we've, we've hit our, our mark. Um, but you've mentioned consciousness. And, uh, and what's interesting to me uh, just as a person who observes language, is that languages certainly do follow rules, but they don't follow orders, uh, mm -hmm. which is to say that consciousness is what makes change. Uh, awareness is what makes change, whether that's in the culture or then reflected in the language. And this has been a micro to the macro conversation about all of that. And I want to thank all three of you for participating tonight. Um, thank you, Lawrence Carter Long. Thank you, Laura Rauscher. And thank you, Fred Pelka from New England Public Media for a great conversation. And of course, the conversation is really just beginning because we, we'll, we'll continue this um, throughout our daily lives and through your good work. Um, so thank you to all who are participating and who are watching. And, uh, and welcome to those who have uh, viewed this as a, uh, as a YouTube video or on our website after the event. So have a great evening and thank you for your uh, ideas and thank you for your work. Thank you all. Thank you.